So we're back with question 23 from the 2021 VCAR chemistry exam. And this is a titration question. A student titrated 25 mils of three different concentrations of organic acid against the standard potassium hydroxide solution. The results are shown below. So we've got titration one, two, three. So these are the three examples. Here's our titrations, here's our average. Okay, so these are all good, that's fair enough. This one here, they've got an outlier here. So they have they excluded that? They have not excluded that. And here, this is all good. Which of the following statements about is consistent with the data shown? Con sample two is the most concentrated acid. With sample two, they used the least amount of <coughs> um, base. So therefore it wouldn't be very concentrated. So that's not right. Sample three is the most concentrated acid. Sample three is here, that has the largest um, tighter, so they put the most base, so the most base, so that means it must have had the most acid. They were all the same um, volume of aliquot, so therefore that is true. There is not enough information to draw a valid conclusion, no, we're pretty good. The averages in the table are correct as all results are concordant. No, I've said that this one should have been excluded from it, so the answer there is B, because we have used more base, so therefore the acid must be more concentrated in that particular situation. And remembering when you calculate the average of a titer, you need to make sure you exclude any non-concordant results, so they're the ones that are out by more than probably 0.1 of a mil. Um, so let's move on. Question 24. Which of the following statements describes the effect of adding a catalyst um, will have on the energy profile for an exothermic reaction? So what we've got here is an energy profile diagram for an exothermic reaction. Adding a catalyst does this. So it lowers the activation energy. So what's happening here? The energy product for the energy of the products will remain the same. That's fair enough. That's true. Um, because we don't change how much energy the products have, we still have the same amount of energy being released. It just gets released quicker. The shape of the energy will remain the same. No, we can see that it's changed. It's gone down there. The peak of the energy profile will move to the left. No, we're simply just going to have the peak is going to be the same in here. Um, the activation energy will be lowered by the same proportion in the forward and reverse reactions. No, because what's happening is this here is the activation energy for our forward reaction. And this here is our an activation energy for the reverse reaction. So hang on, should we get only down here? That's the energy. So therefore what we've got is this versus this. So here, this is our uncatalyzed reaction going from here to here. And this is our catalyzed reaction. So that's the forward reaction. It's kind of decreased a little bit. In the reverse, it's going from this here to here. So you can see that it's only gone down a little bit. So therefore that's not right at all. It's going to be A, the energy of the products will remain the same. That's, that's guaranteed to be true because you're still going to release the same amount of energy. Our products are the same. So therefore the energy held in the products are going to be the same as well. So that's question 24. Question 25. Different metal ion metal um, Solids, half cells are combined with the indium, I think it's indium, IN anyway, half cell to create a galvanic cell at standard level conditions as shown in the diagram below. I've, I was a bit out of the shot there anyway. Um, the equation for the, in the half cell is this, this is our E naught value. So that what that means is I can put that onto my electrochemical series that I've been using. So here, uh, where am I? Where's my electric series? Just on the back of my periodic table, I believe. There it is. So therefore, if that's it there, this guy sits in right about here. All right, so this is the IN. IN three positive, IN solid. Okay, so straight away, if I know where my E naught value is, I can put it on my electrochemical series, and that way it makes life a bit easier. Which of the following half shells shows the half cells in decreasing order of voltage when combined with this half cell and the INS in the solid is a negative electrode. Negative electrode means it's the anode, so therefore we'll have it going backwards. So therefore if it's the negative electrode it must be the anode and that must be going back this way. So what we have is these guys must be above it over here to make that downward slope. They must be stronger, um, strong enough oxidants 
to react with that because if that's a negative electrode, it's the anode, so therefore it's oxidation. So therefore you are looking for things that are oxidants to cause that oxidation to occur. So which of these metal ions are above my indium um, here? So um, manganese, no, that's, well, that's not gonna work. There's gonna be no voltage produced there. So I'm gonna say no to that one. Magnesium, again, um, it should be down here. You can see magnesium's down here. You're gonna have no reaction occurring there. Um, copper, lead, copper, I believe is above it. So therefore copper is here, yep. Um, lead is here and nickel is here, so it could be these. It's gonna be C or D, but what we wanna say is they are decreasing order of voltage. So therefore the first one must have the highest voltage, then to the next one, then to the next one. So the copper here is gonna be having the highest voltage. So the highest voltage will be this because they're the furthest away from each other. And then we're gonna have lead, then we're gonna have nickel. So it's gonna be C because nickel is gonna have the lowest amount of voltage produced. So therefore question 26 answer will be C. Moving on to question 27 now. Uh, question 27 um, and 28 refer to this particular system. So let's have a look at what we've got. We've got hydrogen and iodine reacting to form this. This looks like a equilibrium question. The graph below shows the concentrations in a sealed container. A change was made, all the concentrations went up, so therefore that change there would have been a, are they gaseous or aqueous? They're gaseous. So therefore we had a volume decrease, right, to increase all of those concentrations. You can see if we increase all the concentrations, we have to volume decrease. We push or squeeze or push the, a gas syringe in to increase all those concentrations in one hit. So which of the following statements is correct? A catalyst was added at time t. No, because um, a catalyst wouldn't change the concentrations. We would speed up the reaction, but the concentrations wouldn't change instantaneously like that. The amount of HI is greater at T3 compared to T1. Alrighty, so what we've got here is understanding that the amount, not the concentration, the amount, that means mole. Okay, so mole means that we've had a shift in the um, direction of the equation. Now, if we volume decrease, it's going to go to the side with uh, less particles. So therefore, Chatelier says we want to oppose that decrease in volume by favouring this, or oppose that increasing all concentrations by favouring the side with the least amount of particles. We've got one particle, because half and half makes one on this side and one on that side. So therefore, there's actually going to be no shift in equilibrium at all. And you can see that because it's just staying there. So the answer is no. There's going to be the same amount um, present. It's just a higher concentration. The rate of the reaction producing HI, no, that's not gonna be true. The rate's gonna increase because the concentration's all increased and because we um, obviously are using a smaller amount of volume, therefore they're gonna have a higher frequency of successful collisions, so it's not gonna be that one. The rate of production at time three is double the rate of the production of H2 at time um, three. All right, so the rate of production of that is double the rate of production of that. All right, so therefore we're producing twice as much as that as we are of that. The ratio here says we are, so therefore that must be true. All righty, so therefore the Ford's and reverse reactions are equal, so therefore the Ford's reaction is producing one mole of this, the backwards reaction is producing half a mole of that, so D has to be right for question 27. Also, through power elimination, not A, not B, not C, D is right. Um, it's a bit of a randomly worded question, but D is definitely correct for that one. Moving on, question 28. One change that was made to the equilibrium system at T4, so at T4 here, all right, which altered the equilibrium constant. If it altered the equilibrium constant, it must be a temperature change. The equilibrium was re-established at time five. The rate of the reverse reaction at time five is higher than at time three. So therefore our rate of the reverse reaction is 
there. So therefore, what is going to happen if the rate is higher and it was a temperature change, it must be a increase in temp. Alrighty, so we can't have a higher rate of reaction if we decrease the temperature. Um, even if the backwards reaction is favoured with an increase in temp, with the decrease in temperature, you're still going to have a lower rate of reaction. So therefore, it definitely has to be an increase in temperature. So um, that means the total energy. I'm just going back here. Total energy of the chemicals must increase. So therefore, I'm going to say it's not going to be that one. It's not going to be that one. Now, what happens to the equilibrium constant? If I increase the temperature, let's have a look at the um, information. If I increase the temperature, it's going to favor the endothermic reaction, which is the Ford's reaction. So therefore, our K will increase. So therefore, equilibrium constant is going to increase and uh, it's going to be A. Question 28 must be A. But again, looking through what actually happened, try and work out from the information, what was the change that occurred? It altered the equilibrium constant, so it must have been a temperature change. The rate was higher, so therefore it must have been an increase in temperature. How does that impact on what's happening here? Also, we know the fact that um, if it increases in temperature, the chemical energy must increase as well because we've, um, yeah, that's the idea. Move on to question 29. Almost done our multiple choice for today. Uh, the following diagram shows two connected electrochemical cells, this one here, um, which of the following gives the energy transformations that occur in cell one and cell two. Alrighty, so what's happening here is these are galvanic cells. Um, so they're galvanic cells. We have electron flow um, from our zinc over here to our nickel. All right, so electrons flows here. So therefore that means that this is gaining electrons. So this is the cathode, cathode, alrighty. And this is the anode and this is the cathode, and this is the anode. Let's have a look at what must be happening in this situation. So, um, and we can do that by looking at our electrochemical series. Are they both galvanic cells? They might not be. I guess that's what this question is asking us. Um, if we need to know if it's a spontaneous reaction, I guess. If this is a spontaneous situation, let's see what's happening. Anode is zinc, cathode is copper. So anode is zinc is here. So anode is, where's zinc? Zinc's down here. This is zinc. If that's the anode, it's going backwards. Alrighty. If this is the cathode, which is the copper, it's going forwards, we have a downhill slope. Okay. So therefore, that must be, um, actually, yep, all right, so that's fine. So therefore, that's reacting going forwards, that's reacting going backwards. So that must be a galvanic cell. Let's have a look at copper and nickel. So copper's here again. Copper here. And nickel is here. Now, copper in this case must be the anode. Oh, sorry, copper here must be the anode. So therefore, that must be going backwards. So it must be this guy reacting. And then this guy, the nickel, is going forwards because he is the cathode. And we know the nickel's the cathode because the electrons are going towards it. So it's gaining electrons and it's becoming um, reduced. So therefore, if that's going forwards and that's going backwards, it's an uphill slope. So therefore, it must be going as an electrolytic cell. So therefore, we have electrolytic cells. So energy going in, electrons going into this cell electrons going out of this cell. So therefore, we have got chemical energy to electrical energy here in cell one. So therefore, it's not going to be this one or this one. And we have electrical energy going into chemical energy here. So therefore, the answer must be C. And that's the answer to question 29, C. Just going through what must they be? Can they be galvanic cells based on electrochemical series? Or do they have to be electrolytic cells based on electrochemical series? Do we have a downhill slope making this guy a um, galvanic cell? Or do we have an uphill slope making it an electro electrolytic cell? Question 30. The HNMR spectrum of an organic compound shows three unique sets of peaks. All right, so therefore there are three environments. A single peak, so therefore they have um, either just a carbon or a have an OH. 
several peaks. So therefore they have like next to CH3 um, and CH3 like this, probably. Um, seven peaks, so that will be next to a um, two CH3s. And two peaks, which is a doublet. So therefore they have a CH there. So what we've got is all these things here happening. So how, which of these compounds will have that? Let's draw them out and let's have a think about it. So methyl butanoic acid, one, two, three, four. Butanoic acid looks like this. Uh, methyl is, so three methyl is there. So therefore we have three H3, CH3, CH3, that's good. There is a CH2 here um, and there will be a H here. This guy here will be split into more than seven, so therefore that's not right. And there's one, two, three, four environments in this guy, so I don't think it's going to be that one. Two methyl propanoic acid. This is already thinking that it's pretty good because of um, the fact that this had too many. We're just cutting it short. Let's have a look at this one. We've got our singlet here. That will be a nice singlet. This guy here will be split into our seven. This guy here will be our doublet. Alrighty, so that look, that's looking pretty good. There's three environments that they sit there. Let's just rule out a few of these other ones. Um, propane, methyl propane. Uh, there's methyl and there's chloro. So therefore, what have we got? Uh, CH3 is all the way around. There, all in the one environment. There's only one environment there, so it can't be that one, can't be that one. And one, two dichloro, methyl propane. I can't see this actually working either, but let's have a look at it. Uh, one, two, so chlorine there, and a chlorine there, and a carbon there. There's two, uh, no, I can't see this working. These guys will be in the same environment, so that's one peak, there's only one peak there, it has to be B. Answers B, but the key thing here is drawing out the structures quickly and then analyzing them to see which one fits the data that you have given. Um, and that is the question 30 done, and that is our short answer for our 2021 VCAR chemistry exam done and dusted.